Hello, everyone. For just one moment, I'd like you to consider this statement. All planning is based upon one's perception Now, try to think of it in this context. When you drive down the road at night, you turn on your high beams. The question is, why? Why do you turn on those high beams? The number one answer I hear all over the world is, we, I turn on my high beams so that I can see better. Yet in reality, you turn on your high beams to anticipate better. You can see turns, obstacles in advance, and as a result, potentially drive faster. At the same time, you have the added benefit of securing a, wi a wider view, and you can see challenges coming from the sides, and therefore your passengers are not shocked. You have safer and smoother ride. This holds true for life. Conferences such as Horasis are boiled down to the essence of what is your future going to be like? And the challenge in organizations and even individually is there's not enough discussion or deep discussion about the future. There are aspirational discussions, yet often missing the pragmatic and the complex interconnectedness that happens when you're talking about forecasting. I'm going, sure, great futures have their errors, and yet the best analogy I can think of when you're thinking about forecasting in a similar light would be to think of a meteorologist. What we'd love to aspirationally tell everyone that tomorrow is going to be a beautiful day. We'd prefer to hear from our meteorologists an accurate forecast that they can share, and we can do something with that. That said, our host Frank and I, over the past uh, few weeks, have been talking about the value of a conference, and that what we'd like to have happen is that the individuals, you out there, are going to be thinking about your future. To help us along, we've created two programs, this program, the Opening Plenary, which will be looking at the role the United States will play in the world in the year 2035 on this world stage. Where will the United States be in set? And the second, this afternoon, we'll be addressing what the United States will look like in the year 2035. Now, one question is, why didn't we pick a year like 2050? Why didn't we look that far in advance? Just consider for what's, uh, just consider for a moment what has happened in the past 15 years globally and within the U.S. with the Great Recession, Fukushima, Syria, Snowden, the Arab Spring, it was legalizing marijuana in the United States, SpaceX launched a reusable rocket, it was Brexit, multiple movements from Occupy Wall Street to Me Too to Black Lives Matter. We've seen self-driving cars, Trumpism. We've seen COVID-19 and we've seen an insurrection. Just the next 15 years are gonna be complicated enough to be able to forecast. Today, we've challenged our panelists to give their forecast and the logic behind it so that you can come to new conclusions. We hope you two will also create your own personal forecast over the course of this entire conference. So let's start with a brief introduction of our panel and then myself, and then we'll get to the forecast. There are supposed to be two other guests on, and we're hoping that they do join uh, during the time that we're here. So I'll introduce them at this moment. We have Lord Gregory Barker. He's the former UK Minister for Energy and Climate and the Executive Chairman of N Plus uh, Group, a Russian energy and metals company. We have Chris Kapalakrishnan. Uh, he is the co one of the co-founders and former CEO of Infosys, and presently the CEO of Axelor Ventures. We also have with us uh, Dr. Victoria Coleman. She is the former director of DARPA, who is now back at Berkeley focusing on technology and technology policy. And yet there's some late breaking news that uh, the, she is going to be the chief scientist of the Air Force. So congratulations, Victoria, that's, uh, that's amazing. And then we have Dini and Solomon. He's the former U.S. Executive Director for the World Bank Group under Obama administration. And imagine this, in the past year and a half, he became the Dean of the University of Virginia, 
imagine the unanticipated consequences of COVID and his role at the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy. I'm David Goldsmith, president and founder of the Goldsmith Organization, as well as the president and founder of the Project Moon Hut Foundation. We were named by NASA, where we intend on improving how we live on Earth for all species. The program will consist of, and again, hopefully our other panelists will show, that there will be uh, the forecast that they're going to deliver and the logic that they use to get there. Then afterwards, we'll have some questions between all of us. So given that there are two people here today, what uh, I'd like to start with just in terms of who we brought on, we'll start with you, Victoria. What's your forecast? Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, let's see. So our homework today, um, as David described, uh, is to offer an opinion um, and debate what we believe the role of the United States will be on the global stage in 2035. So the short answer for me is that it will be the same as it was 173 years ago. Um, when, on December 1st, 1862, one month before signing the Emancipation Proclamation, President Lincoln sent a long message to Congress. Um, and here's what he said. He said, fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress and this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves. No personal significance or insignificance can spare one or another of us. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. We say we are for the Union. The world will not forget that we say this. We know how to save the Union. The world knows we do know how to save it. We, even we here, hold the power and bear the responsibility. In giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free, honorable alike in what we give and what we preserve. We shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope on earth. Other means may succeed. This could not fail. The way is plain, peaceful, generous, just, a way which, if followed, the world will forever applaud. That's what Lincoln said, and he said it much better than I could have done. So America is different. Um, our nation was founded on a set of Republican ideas rather than common heritage, ethnicity, or ruling elite. And this, I believe, is the enduring foundation of American exceptionalism. America was not born as a world power or cultural phenomenon. There was no such thing as manifest destiny to the American experiment. But the pilgrims made the perilous crossing of the ocean to avoid religious persecution and carve life and the future out of unknown parts with perseverance and optimism. And that recipe proved to be very powerful indeed. All the way from the pilgrims to the war of independence, to the civil war, to emancipation, to the Great Depression, to world wars, the values on which America was founded endure. The American dream endures. If we then wish to forecast what America's role on the world stage will be, we can start from what brought us here in the first place, American exceptionalism. What are the ingredients? Liberty, equality before the law, individual responsibility, republicanism, representative democracy, and the safer economics. Our history, our revolutionary origins, our size, our geography, our political institutions, and our culture means that America marches to a different drummer, as political scientist Richard Rose noted in 1989. Now, how do we experience that today? How did I experience it as a European transplant? Well, you become American in a single generation. Our democracy is broad and is deep, and that affords the ordinary citizen an opportunity to affect extraordinary outcomes, pioneering perseverance and optimism. But as I said earlier, there is no manifest destiny. There are threats to American exceptionalism, undermining our political institutions, confusing exceptionalism with exemptionalism, a weakened economy with loss of innovation and scaling here at home, 
Emma Lazarus wrote her famous New Colossus Sonnet in 1883. She said, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. So, it's up to us. We shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope of Earth. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, welcome, Lord Barker. We've already, Hello. We've, I'm so sorry to be uh, late joining you. Uh, <laughs> we've already done the introduction, so they, uh, they know that you're coming, and now you're here. So we'll continue on. Ian? Great. Uh, welcome, Lord Barker. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, uh, Victoria. Great to be with you all. It's an honor to join this panel of experts and innovators as dean of a school of leadership in public policy, I am interested in knowing the future so that our faculty can do the research for solving pressing public policy challenges and so our students can develop skills for leadership from now to 2035 and beyond. One of the things I learned during the 2008 financial crisis working in the Obama administration is that people are often convinced that their era has reached the peak of complexity and vulnerability for this American democratic experiment. It often feels like the worst of times until the next generation proves us wrong. This was true in the 1940s, the 1960s, the 1980s, the 2000s. It's true now, and I suspect it will also feel true in the 2030s as well. And yet, so far, at least, that I appreciate, Victoria, for starting with Abraham Lincoln, we have adapted, we have endured. Um, before I share my forecast, I want to take a moment to recognize the people around the globe who are struggling while their countries are still ravaged by the coronavirus. Even as the United States begins to glimpse what we expect is the light of the tunnel, it is worth remembering that vulnerability anywhere is a threat to all of us. So I remind my students how different things might be, how different things might have turned out if Americans had cared just a little bit more about the people in Wuhan 14 months ago. Now, making a useful forecast requires us to examine global trends and future prospects of continuity, discontinuity, interaction. And you know, right now, the, the weather forecast, the normally beautiful Charlottesville, Virginia, where I sit, shows a 90% chance of rain, which might be characterized more optimistically as a 10% chance of sun. This forecast, of course, is based on models of high and low pressure systems, cloud cover, wind speed, the interaction of atmospheric variables measured historically. And my school, the Frank Batten School, was actually founded by the visionary leader behind weather.com and the Weather Channel. Looking at the forecast for the U.S. in the world in 2035, several important trends stand out. First, I forecast high probability that the speed of technological change will continue to accelerate reshaping systems of employment, transportation, education, healthcare, finance, governance, and more. 14 years ago, is when we first had the iPhone. 14 years from now, in 2035, we'll see more speed, more computational power, more connectivity between people, objects, more powerful algorithms driving the integration of artificial intelligence, machine learning, facial recognition, biotechnology. These developments will yield substantial, overwhelming benefits. They will also be highly disruptive to jobs, to human psychology, to political systems. And at present, I forecast a much lower probability that our moral, social, and regulatory frameworks will keep up with and manage the disruptive risks of this technological growth. Now, there's already significant healing and repair required in America to deal with high levels of fear and distress from seen from addiction rates, suicide, gun ownership levels, incarceration rates, racism, insurrection, conspiracy theories, lots of illness to observe. Our political culture and institutions proved more fragile than expected. And there is a massive public policy challenge for all of us on this on this Zoom today to, to renew faith and trust in America's future, or as Victoria said, the last best hope. Alongside continuing political volatility, I forecast increasing climate volatility with more dangerous storms, changing agricultural zones, rising immigration pressures, escalating resource conflicts, 
We will face real pressure in large and growing dense urban areas at our borders and potentially on food supplies. I forecast high probability for continued rebalancing of geopolitical influence toward Asia, coupled with rising incomes and expectations. With 60% of global population, Asia's growing strength will largely restore the historical norm And that doesn't necessarily mean conflict, but it does elevate that probability. I have a more difficult time, regrettably, forecasting a revival of influence for international institutions, the UN, including the UNFCCC, the Bretton Woods institutions, and multilateral development banks, the WTO, International Court of Justice. None of these appears anywhere near the height of influence, nor prepared at present to fill the gap of multilateral leadership legitimacy. So, so far, my forecast may sound gloomy, like the 90% chance of rain here in Charlottesville, but there is a massive unknown variable in my prediction model. The unknown variable is what will the quality of U.S. leadership be? How effective will our leadership be at adapting to the challenges of a world that is more volatile, more uncertain, more complex, more ambiguous, more VUCA? How devoted to science and evidence-based policy democratic rather than authoritarian norms, how resilient in the face of a toxic political culture. As someone who works with students, I have the privilege and the responsibility to be optimistic. I am convinced there can still be lots of sun in this forecast right behind the clouds. And our future will depend on the quality of leadership and public policy that we cultivate. We have a lot of work to do, and you may want to take an umbrella just in case. Thank you. So I love the meteorologist compare, uh, connection that we have. So, Lord Barker. Um, thank you. And again, apologies for joining late. I think anybody indulging in uh, forecastology um, at this particular point in time um, really uh, is extremely brave or, or very foolish because after the year that we've had, um, in 2020, trying to say anything with any certainty about the near future, let alone the long-term future, is a bit of a mugs game. But nevertheless, I will have a go. <laughs> um, so um, it, what is the role of the USA? It really, I think the real question is, what is, before you can answer that, is what is the greatest challenge that, as a global community, we face? And then what is the, the role of the USA in, in responding to that. And for me, and for most people, without doubt, as we, na- as we navigate past COVID-19, the greatest challenge of our time is climate change, as uh, Ian alluded to. And without doubt, we will not tackle effectively, let alone defeat dangerous man-made climate change without American leadership. And we've had some full starts on that. Um, I was at Arnold Schwarzenegger's and he gave a typically uh, Obama-esque inspirational message talking about how the U.S. was going to show real leadership on the climate agenda, whether that were, you know, cap and trade, carbon taxing, and really um, a step up to the historic role of global leadership on key global issues um, by the U.S. And I became quite emotional. At the time, I was... uh, sitting next to me in the in the audience and said this is terrific it's this is just like pearl harbor um at that point he looked rather shocked and and i really uh, suddenly realized that certain uh, historical analogies don't necessarily cross the atlantic in the way that you might like them to and i had to quickly explain that to a, to a brit pearl harbor was that moment um not you know that is best remembered for the point when the USA entered World War II and the defeat of fascism became inevitable 
Um, and while in the US, of course, it's remembered for the tragic loss of life and the sinking of the Arizona, etc. In that night in uh, 1941, Churchill went to bed uh, and slept soundly for the first time in many months and made a one line entry in his diary. So we won after all. And that, to a certain extent, is how I feel about US leadership on climate. And it was a full start because actually the Obama administration was not effective um, on tackling climate change for a number of reasons. But mostly they decided to spend their political capital on a different agenda. And then we've had an administration which almost was in outright climate denial. But now we do have an American administration, which I believe is equal to the task, certainly has shown commendable ambition and has set out its administration in a way that is deployed to tackle this issue. Now, I don't underestimate the challenge for any administration in Washington to get things done. And I'm sure there will be the um, the usual you know, uh, trade offs. But also, nor do I put all of my hope um, in just the federal government in the states providing this leadership, because I think the greatest thing that US has is the extraordinary capacity for innovation and industrial revolution. And if you look at the climate challenge, we know that all of the answers are not currently known that there, we know the questions, we know the challenges, but the answers in many cases escape us. But what we do know is that if there is enough ingenuity, enough investment, enough focus, that you know, with a fair wind, we can actually crack this and we can at least try and keep global warming below one and a half degrees. But that's going to require an amazing effort, not just from the US, but from governments right the way around the world, but also from an unprecedented collaboration between private and, and public sectors. And it is that great private sector in the US that is this engine of global innovation that I think will ensure that going forward, certainly through to 2035, that the most exciting climate related innovations and technology commercialization are happening in a large part um, in America. And I think with the leadership coming from the US. That must mean that the US remains absolutely essentially um, glued into the solutions for climate change. Now, we've got the um, COP26 in Glasgow this autumn. That will be a litmus test of how serious the world's governments are in uh, addressing this issue. And it's obviously requires not just the US, but the, the other big emitters, China, the European Union, um, uh, in India uh, uh, and others to actually play their appropriate role. And they've all got different roles to play and different levels of ambition. But I think without the US, it would have been difficult to see how we could have got there. But now we've got the, the US in. I think if we get this next year right, you could lock, lock in a very exciting decade or more of innovation and leadership on what I regard as the most important question of our time. Thank you. And welcome, Chris. How are you? Good, uh, David. Sorry, the time change I did not realize. And uh, uh, I had marked as 7.15 India Standard Time. In reality, it's 6.15 India Standard Time, but I'm here now. No worries. The, the one challenge with this type of technology is you can't sneak in the back. <laughs> 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 so uh, what's your, project, uh, project, your forecast for the future? <clears throat> Uh, the America, uh, the, the U.S. and its role in the global stage? So um, at the government level, I believe that U.S. will lose, further lose its uh, ability to influence uh, uh, the world affairs in the, you know, in the next 15 years, that is through 2035. It will be weakened further uh, with uh, the government focused inwardly into the uh, domestic politics, into the need to address the challenges that are facing domestically. Uh, it, will, it will not be able to address the issue of uh, uh, pandemics, sustainability, etc. at the global level, but focus domestically. Um, and, and 
the private sector's influence will continue to grow. You will have global companies because U.S. will still be the um, the innovation and research capital of the world because of the amazing ability to attract uh, uh, people from the best people from around the world. So on the on the political side, on the government side, it will lose its um, ability to influence. There will be a multipolar world. Uh, was or uh, as we know it will not be able to create an impact and there will not be a stomach for was um, uh, in the future we have already seen this um, you know in the in the issue of uh, vaccine itself you know what go what us government has said is let us satisfy the requirement domestically first before we can think of supplying to the rest of the world so again it's it's it is a um, it's it's driven by the uh, domestic compulsions and things like that in the area of sustainability uh, the rest of the world is looking for uh, funding resources as well as solutions from the us us may be able to provide solutions but i believe that the ability to fund the ability to provide resources the ability to lead the world by example will be um, limited even when it comes to uh, fossil fuels you know on one side, U.S. has to expand the market, expand its um, you know reach from a business perspective, but will be limited in the ability to show the world that it is actually meeting its commitments um, to Paris Accord and things like that. And, and I, I unfortunately feel that uh, is uh, the ability to influence the world um, by its leadership and uh, and here clearly um, in a, in a, in in a in a multipolar world where um, you know even smaller countries are going to challenge uh, uh, you know us uh, as as we have seen um, today um, you know it, it is going to be a, a challenge uh, for the us uh, us will continue to be uh, the R&D capital, the R&D engine for um, uh, the world. And, and the benefit of this will actually accrue to the private sector and the private industry. Um, it, it, will, it will create a lot more um, um, space for um, uh, its, um, you know, its, its uh, uh, you know, let's say, uh, emerging uh, corporations and things like that. So when I look at biotech, for example, you know, the, the example of um, the vaccines, right? Uh, the vaccines were created in record time. Uh, the vaccine IP is owned by primarily U.S. companies, U.S. registered entities, and it is taken to uh, across the world, right? So uh, that's just one example of how uh, the the leadership of us in the private sector will continue um, and 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 this could create potentially challenges from a regulatory uh, framework perspective it will create uh, challenges from taxation so the rest of the world will look at to look to tax uh, uh, global income of these corporations the rest of the world will look to tax the capital gains and the valuation bubble that us corporations are going to have and, and 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 look at solutions where the benefits of um, you know global markets, the benefits of um, income from revenue from global markets is uniformly uh, distributed to the rest of the world. Uh, these inequalities will have to be uh, addressed more. And again, uh, again, the 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 moral leadership the, of uh, US will deteriorate further if they continue to support um, their uh, uh, multinational corporations and things like that. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Chris. I want to get on to some questions. So appreciate it. Uh, Ian, you had said earlier that you had a question for Victoria. What was that question? Thank you. And this is, this is terrific. And I'm, uh, I think, 
This forecasting's hard, David. Meteorologists often have to like, they caveat a lot of their forecasts. And I think all of us see, you know, both 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 threats and opportunities. And I think I resonate very strongly with Victoria's final line that it's up to us. Right? I, I think that uh, and the choices that we make. And I think as as Lord Barker talked about during um, you know, the uh, climate the early days of Obama administration on climate, some choices made and then constraints to actually follow through on some of that. And I think uh, as, uh, you know, Chris talks about with the, you know, constraints U.S. leadership might face when its own corporations are being more heavily taxed abroad. But I actually continue to believe, as Victoria does, that the values and the opportunity to rise above narrow self-interests has, you know, the U.S. has, has done this at times and feared away from this at times, right? We've been a moral leader and haven't and, and have had courage on the global stage. And we've also shown disastrous leadership and, 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 and real cowardice on the global stage at times. And I think that, you know, um, the values, the principles, the kind of the, 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 what the U.S. has stood for, my sense is the world still very much wants. The world is hungry in climate change, on issues of taxation and financial flows, on issues of, of security. The U.S. wants a moral values-based U.S. leadership. And the question is whether the U.S. people also want that. And that's part of the challenge for U.S. leaders to cultivate that internally. Having lived in Hong Kong and lived in Europe, living, lived in Europe, I've seen a mixed perspective around the world of what America's future will be. There are people who believe that America is on its downfall and it will not continue. And there are people who are looking aspirationally that America will rise up and lead. In very short answers, because you don't have a lot of time, do you see America taking the lead in the world stage, sitting at the table as another player, or actually diminishing their um, their position, as we've seen somewhat in the last administration, was America, America great. So it was about America first and the world in, in a different perspective. Where do you fall in terms of how you see 2035 playing out? I'm trying to build leaders who choose the first option, but do it in a way that recognizes a multipolar world. And it's not U.S. being the dominant player, but a dominant player. Victoria. Well, so um, I, um, I believe that, well, I believe that we are the last best hope. So uh, I, uh, I truly believe that the way that, you know, our political institutions and our, you know, our, our discourse is structured, even though, you know, uh, it has its ups and downs is actually the best kind of, you know, fulcrum in which this contest of ideas is fought. Um, I, um, I remain optimistic, I, but I think that it's, um, as we saw in the Obama administration, it depends what it is that we want to emphasize at any, any part of our history. And I do believe there is a case for uh, rebuilding the middle class, uh, which I believe is a current president, one of current president's um, um, uh, ideas. And I believe the fact that, uh, for example, you know, over the last 50 years or so, even longer, we have excelled at innovation, but we've not excelled at scaling those businesses here at home, has created a deep divide in our nation. Uh, has deprived many of opportunities that um, they should be in, they should have been afforded. So I think from my perspective, and I don't want to use slogans of like American first or otherwise, but you know a nation um, is responsible for maintaining its own economic prosperity, and I think that cannot be just be based on innovation. We talk about you know the U.S. Chris, you know, and kind of pointed out that this is the place. At least the world in innovation and having you know worked at DARPA, I, I completely um, agree with that. But it's not about it's not just just about innovation. Uh, it's also about our ability to, to translate those innovations into manufacturing, into scalable businesses here at home that create good jobs, that engage people, that give people hope that the American dream will continue. Uh, and we need to do that as well as be present and lead at the world stage. Lord Barker, I love your comment on the perspective of Pearl Harbor. Uh, that, that, that was brilliant. That, that's brilliant to open up the doors to individuals who are microcosmic in their view. So what is your take 
as to where America will position itself on this global stage, uh, high, medium, low, or left, right, center? How do you see it based upon what I gave you? That's a really difficult question to answer with any real you know, credibility. <laughs> um, but uh, personally, I, th I think in a way, the most important thing to remember is that, you know, the, the, the America is basically owes its leadership position to its economic power. Um, sure. Fundamentally, everything rests on that. Um, and while we are obviously going towards a multi, or maybe we're already in a multipolar world, you know, it, we're not going to see return to a situation or persist in a situation that we saw at the end of the Cold War or at the end of the Second World War. We are, we're definitely in a multipolar world. But when the world economy grows, everybody benefits. Um, we used to have a saying, in, you know, or still do in Europe, you know, when America catches, um, sneezes, we catch cold. And so, for so long, the American econ economy has been the dominant economy um, <clears throat> for much of the world. And we've, we've, we've ridden on its coattails. But we should, global growth is not a zero sum game. If you know, if Asia is growing, that doesn't mean to say that it is to the detriment of the US. Um, and actually, there is a you know there is a strong symbiotic relationship, but increasingly between all of the economies around the world. And you, the US will benefit from growth in Asia because there are more markets for its products. And where the US really does well is selling. You know, value is not a you know, build you know, make them cheap, pile them high economy anymore it's a value added um almost experiential economy and i think the us is going to be very well placed to cater to a more affluent asia and a more you know affluent global marketplace um rather than be left behind and i think actually the challenge will be for many asian countries that perhaps their advantage in recent decades has been their large pool of cheap labor they are the ones who perhaps are going to be challenged as the world becomes more prosperous, not those that rely on innovation and ad added value. Now, nothing is a is a given, but I do think we've got to get out of this sort of, you know, zero sum game mindset. I I would facilitators not are always supposed to agree or disagree. Having lived in Asia, I believe there is a positive influence on the activities that have happened through that region. Tier one, two, and three countries have opportunities. And tier four countries are more difficult to be able to maneuver in the same way. So, uh, yes, I see that. How about you, Chris? You had a, a much different perspective. So, um, you know, uh, I I feel that um, um, you know it is going to be challenging for US even to ex um, to to um, express its uh, economic power because um, um, you know there are other countries that are now growing and less dependent on uh, us they will be able to actually support um, you know um, trade they will be able to support um, uh, investments they will be able to look at uh, uh, even um, you know replacing some of the us uh, corporations uh, in terms of um, being able to supply products they will own the brands uh, so uh, both from a uh, political, moral, and even economic, uh, uh, you know, influence. I I strongly believe that U.S. will lose its um, ability to influence the rest of the world, and they will also lose uh, uh, the moral uh, influence in the rest of the world. The only area where U.S. will continue to benefit from its R&D and uh, innovation ecosystem, and the and the you know, the venture uh, risk capital ecosystem is to create uh, global corporations which are able to operate across the world. But in all the other areas, both from an influence, both from a leadership by example, both, uh, you know, from uh, a, an ability to showcase to the world that they are able to manage this better than anybody else, I, I believe that U.S. will lose its leadership. Chris, can I ask a question? Do you think international institutions will be relevant in this new era? You know, we need to reinvent the international institutions if you want them to be relevant. If uh, the international institutions are, um, you know, 
to, today the international in, institutions have been dominated by few countries but uh, you know and and primarily the developed countries you know us including uh, but in the future you will have to give space for other countries to come in and that's going to be a very difficult transition because you know you don't want to give up your position and unless you're willing to give up that position uh, and figure out a new equilibrium the international institutions will find it quite challenging and we are already seeing that actually so uh, we don't have much time left and not enough time to probably answer a final question. So for all of the those of you who are out there listening, forecasting is extremely hard work. And we don't do enough of it to be able to understand on a global scale what type of implications our world will be facing over the years to come. So we are going to be having a second panel uh, in at 1530 where the U.S. will be looking at scenarios of where the U.S. will be in the year 2035. And I hope you came to some of your own conclusions as to what tomorrow will be like. So to all of you, hope to see you one day in person. And I'm David Goldsmith, and thank you all for listening. Thanks, David. Thank you. Welcome.